Hello ATS 315 students, Dr. Shragi here, and we are ready to be working on assignment 12. And you guys are getting great with this graphic stuff, uh, you're making maps, you're clipping and so on, and now it's time to take some weather data and put it on the map. And that's going to require a technique about working with arrays. Now the good news is you have been working with, everybody who's in this class has been working with arrays in uh, ATS 564 as well. So the basic idea of an array as like a table of data, you're already down for. But notice what they're going to be doing here. We're going to be making a map that's clipped. Okay, that part you can already do. Uh, your map is probably fairly ugly at first anyway. I mean, you're going to have all these garish colors. Students always do. And, but, you know, probably you want to tone that down to like shades of gray or shades of beige or something because really we are much more interested in the weather that you're plotting on there. So you're going to produce a map and then you're going to be reading the current underscore SAO WXP file and you're going to be using that data to put information onto a map like temperatures or dew points or wind speeds or relative humidity, potential temperatures, saturation mixing ratio, I don't care. I mean, ideally, give the user some options. Okay, the user can enter one for, you know, what would you like to see? One, temperature, two, dew point, and give them a menu like that. All right, but we're not quite there yet. In order to do this, we're going to have to be able to work with these arrays because we're go you're going to see that we're going to have to store an array, <coughs> excuse me, that contains all of the information about all the stations. We're, if you read an observation that comes in as KOMA and then it has the temperature and the dew point and the pressure code, the wind code and all that kind of good stuff. How do you know where KOMA is on your map? We're going to have to have a table where we have all that information. What is the latitude and longitude of KOMA? Okay. Well, like I said, you guys are all in ATS 564. You are all already pros at the whole business of uh, tables and a, a, a matrix arrays is like a table or a, a matrix or a vector or whatever you want to say. Now, I mean, just to kind of review, make sure we're all clear on the concept here. I mean, like, let's say I have a basic little table here. It's got like uh, seven, it's got one column and it's got seven rows in that column. So what would this be? Like maybe this one could ha contain seven floating point numbers. Uh, it has been declared to be an array of floating point numbers that has one column and uh, zero, uh, seven rows. So like I could declare this to be float data and then I would tell it in, in, um, in square brackets that it, there will be as many as seven values in it. Notice that this is different than what we're doing in Octave. In Octave, we don't need to tell it in advance. We don't tell the Octave interpreter how many rows there needs to be in this array or how many columns is. You know, it just picks that information up from when you say Y equals B naught plus B1 times X, however many rows and columns are in X, becomes how many rows and columns there are and why. It's pretty slick. That's because Octave is a ver version of the commercially available program MATLAB, which is expressly for working with arrays and matrices. That ends the MAT in MATLAB. It's for matrix. Well, C isn't that way. It, it, it does, it's a multi-purpose computer tool, and we have to actually be telling it things like, okay, when you declare this variable, make it a floating point. When you declare this variable, make it an integer. Now we're saying declare an array. This array we're creating is going to be, in this case, let's just say it's called data, and we're telling it it's going to have seven elements in it. Okay, one row, seven elements. Um, in this case, the array is being called data, and data is a one-dimensional array with seven elements in total, each of which con is containing a float. So there will be a value data, the numbers start at zero, so data square brackets zero, all the way up to data square brackets six. Notice, just to compare it again to octave, in C, the index of the arrays is not in parentheses, it's in square brackets. So, and notice that unlike in, in, in octave, where you work from, let's say your, your array has n values in it, in octave you work from data one to data n, in C you would work from data zero to data n minus one. Okay, so by declaring out an array float data 7 means we've created an array that has seven elements in it going from data 0 to data 7. All right, so that is the main uh, structure as to how we create arrays in uh, for floating point arrays. Um, arrays, as we do already in ATS-564, arrays can have multiple dimensions uh, and will through most of the assignments in this class. So, like, 
you know, we can have, for example, a two-dimensional array that has both rows and columns. Think like a spreadsheet here. So maybe I would, this happens to be an array called, I don't know, let's just say my data, and it has five rows and three columns. Notice that by convention, we call that first index rows and the second index columns. Okay, could have been the other way around. It wouldn't hurt anything to use them the other way around, but it works a whole lot better for all thinking the same way. And in meteorology, we tend to use it as rows, columns. So the first index describes which row you're on, counting down from the top, and columns describes which column you're in, starting at the left and working your way right. In practice, there is no, I mean, in principle anyway, there is no limit to the number of dimensions the, the array can have. You can have a one-dimensional array that just is a column of data. You can have a two-dimensional array that's like a spreadsheet. You can have a three-dimensional array. You can have multiple dimensional I mean, often it's the case that the third dimension of a, in meteorology, the third dimension on an array is time. So like maybe you have a, an, an array that stores sea surface temperatures where one dimension is storing the latitudes, the other one is storing it lat longitude, so each, and then at each time you have like a page of these, so you have a three dimensional array. Uh, it's not at all uncommon to have four dimensional arrays in meteorology. There is a, there is a limit, I forget what it is in C, I, I think it can't be greater than like 16 dimensions. Well, you'll never hit that in meteorology, don't worry about that. Now, all the arrays I've showed you so far have been declared to hold floating point numbers, but there's absolutely no reason that you couldn't have an array of integers. And you'll need arrays of integers as well as arrays of floating points in this assignment 12. And so, like here, I could have an integer array that would be declared to be like number of rabbits. Okay, an integer number of rabbits, and it has five rows and three columns. Now, this might, I mean, it's a little hard to understand how we would have negative rabbits and so on, but do you understand what I'm talking about here? It's an integer. It's something we're counting. Um, another thing that they can be is you could have an array of strings. You could have an array called something like instrument that had five rows and three columns, each of which contained a 20 character or, uh, long string, or a string that was up to 20 characters, I guess would be a better way to put it. Now, notice that we're kind of using this, um, uh, these square brackets two different ways. Um, we use square brackets to mean like the index of an array. So like, you know, uh, you know, like we're declaring it to have five rows and then we're declaring it to have three columns and we're using it to declare that it has a tw 20 characters uh, or up to 20 characters in the case of a string. Now, that's actually not a coincidence. A string is actually an array of characters. Character is a type of variable in C where it's just a single symbol, like the letter A, or an exclamation point, or something like that. A string is an array of characters. It's just, it's a, so it's not a coincidence that we use the square brackets for both there. Now, most of the time that we work with an array, we're going to be doing this with loops. So, like, for example, maybe I've defined a constant in my program, I'll call it num days, and, um, you know, that is maybe the number of days in our uh, file, or something like that. And then from zero to i is less than num days, we are f scan fing in a uh, value from an input file called fin, that, and we're going to put that into temperature i. Notice the ampersand there. We're putting it into a value temperature i. So then we have this whole array of temperatures that each stores one for each of the num number of days from zero to num days minus one. Okay. Uh, similarly, we could do the same exact kind of thing, but we could do it where we're printing the values of the array. In general, when you are working with arrays, always think of the operations you do on the arrays happens inside a loop. Now, C has none of the fanciness that we're using in octave with regard to uh, working with arrays. For example, if you have an array called X, and um, if you have an array called min temperature that contains all the min temperatures at your weather station, and you have another array called maximum temperature or max temperature that has all the maximum, you can't like just say average temperature equals min temperature plus max temperature divided by two. That's a fancy schmancy thing in octave. You can't actually do anything like that in C. You would have to have set that up in a loop and inside the loop go from I equals zero to I is less than N where there's N rows in your data or something. And then for each one of them you'd have to add min temperature I plus max temperature I divided by two to get the actual average temperature there. So C is different in how it's thinking about arrays, but you guys have got this idea of arrays down pretty well. I'm actually pretty comfortable with you guys doing this stuff. 
Um, so now, what are we going to actually do with arrays in assignment 12? I mean, when you first looked at that map uh, that was so pretty at the beginning of this presentation, it may not have been obvious why you need a, an array, but actually not only do you need arrays for this assignment, in fact, all the rest of the assignments out to the end of the semester, uh, arrays are central to them. So let's think about how we're going to do what assignment 12 is actually asking you to do. It's asking that what you're going to do is you're going to produce a current weather map. It's not actually current. It's just from the current SAOWXP file. Uh, and you're just going to make a map of the weather conditions that are being reported in there. <clears throat> Let's actually take a look at what we are going to be happening here. I mean, each of these steps that I have enumerated here involve multiple steps, but I'm kind of breaking the problem down for you. Because some of these things you already have done. I mean, you just need to copy that code over to the new program here. Okay, so in assignment 12, clearly the first, well, a early step anyway, is to open the graphics window. You certainly have done that now in a couple of assignments. I'm not expecting that to be a problem. Then you're going to draw a map on that window. Well, you just did that for assignment 11 and do all the clipping and everything. It'll be lovely. Okay, then you're going to open up that SAO WXP, um, current underscore SAO WXP file, and you're going to start reading the observations. You know how to do that from, I think it's assignment 8, where you were reading it in that observation. You'll probably have wanted to prompt the user to enter which variable, but, 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 but let's think more broadly here. You are going to just be reading in this observation, read in an observation, decode it. Let's say you're going to plot temperature. Then figure out where to plot that data. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. That seems to be a problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Because... Mainly the problem here is, how are you going to decide where to plot this? <coughs> Excuse me, I have a tickle. Um, I mean, you just read in a code, KOMA and its temperature code. You're ready to plot it, but you don't know where KOMA is on your plot. How do you decide where to, I mean, how are you going to plot it is gprint. Remember gprintf? Um, you're just going to use gprintf to plot it at the right location, xy. The problem is you don't know where xy is. So we're going to have to work with a file that we will have read in before we did any of that graphic stuff. See all that stuff up there at the top? Open a graphics window, draw the map. Before you got that far, right at the very beginning of your program, you're going to open up a file that contains all of that kind of information of where each of those stations are, and then you'll store that information in arrays, and you'll use that information as, when it comes time to plot. You'll have it, oh, this is the latitude and longitude of Omaha. This is the latitude and longitude of Des Moines, and so on. Now, the name of the file that we are going to be using is called sao.ez.city. And city is misspelled without the I. Um, this is an old file that's been lounging around in atmospheric science departments for 30 years. It's just a version of uh, a database uh, that's been out there since literally the age of DOS, um, uh, of DOS computers. It's a handy little file to have around for lots of reasons. And it's a database that contains, um, I believe it is 6,893 weather stations. There's more than that now. Like I said, this file's been around forever. Um, but it's a useful file because most of the weather stations that we care about haven't moved or anything like that. It is a file that contains then 6,893 rows. And as it happens, it has four columns. Now, the four columns each contain a different piece of information. The first column which we call them zero, is a station identifier. It'll be a typically four-digit code, although make it longer than that. That won't hurt anything because uh, some of them are five. I think one or two are six. I think buoys are six-digit codes, and there's a few weather stations out there that have five-digit codes. I usually play it careful and make my, 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 my stations can be up to ten characters or something. Okay, we'll skip priority for a second. Then the third column, which will be called column two, is uh, the latitude of the station, and the last column is, is the station's longitude. And then there's this weird code called the priority. So what I did here is I just cut and paste in just to show you what the first, oh, I don't know, 10 or 12 lines of uh, sao.ez.city looks like. And um, these stations are actually not just in the United States. Remember, all the weather stations in the United States start with a K or most of them do, but you can see like the very first station is a SMBQ. I have to admit, I don't know where SM, I don't even know which country is S, but um, uh, might be Saudi Arabia actually. Well, wait a minute. Okay, skipping the next number is the is the priority. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. 
And then the latitude and longitude, well, the latitude is only um, three-tenths of a degree off the equator, and it's at 50 degrees west. This is going to be in Suriname, I think. Okay, so, um, yeah, because it would be in northern South America. Uh, yeah, it would, be, it would be somewhere just off the equator in South America. All right, anyway, what's that priority? The priority is a code number that has been given to each weather station to help you decide whether or not to plot it. It's a number from 1 to 5. If you just plotted the stations that were 1s, you'd get, I don't know, maybe 20 stations around the whole United States and maybe, I don't know, 100 stations all around the world. So if your map covers the whole United States, well, you don't want a thousand weather symbols and numbers on top of each other. You might only want to plot Priority 1 stations. Okay. Now, Priority 1 is not like a weather service thing or anything. It's just the person who came up with SAO Easy City database came up with that code. Now, if you zoom in a little bit and you were, maybe your region is just the Midwest, maybe you want to plot the 1s and 2s the Priority 1 and Priority 2 station. There's more Priority 2 stations and they're all kind of about halfway between the, the 1s. So you kind of fill in the gaps. And so if you zoomed in on the Midwest and only plotted Priority 1, you'd probably only get Omaha, I think Omaha's a 2 actually. I think, you know, Kansas City, Chicago, St. Louis or something. But now when you plot the 1s and the 2s, maybe you get 20 stations across the Midwest. If you plot the 1s, the 2s, and the 3s, maybe you get 50 stations across the Midwest. Well, maybe your map's getting a little crazy and cluttered, but you can zoom in farther. Maybe you're just making a map of the Chicago metropolitan area. Well, then you might want to go all the way down and plot stations 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I mean, even Omaha has like seven official National Weather Service stations within the city limits or within the metropolitan area. You know, you might want to plot some of those low priority stations. So this is just a clever little key, this, this uh, priority that uh, the person who originally came up with SAO Easy City came up, decided to do, uh, where they just pick these stations so that they look nice, okay? If you just plot the number one, the priority one stations, you'll get a lovely looking map of like the whole United States with the stations more or less evenly distributed. And if you zoom in and you want to see more stations, plot the ones and the twos or plot the ones and the twos and the threes. And in fact, if it isn't actually SAO Easy City, it's a file very much like this that like every TV station is using when they show, like they zoom out and they show you the national view and you see that it's this much in na temperature in Nashville and this much in Atlanta and this much in Miami. And then they zoom into their area and you see these smaller ones. Do uh, you see more stations coming in? That's almost certainly either SAO Easy City that's doing that or something very, very similar. So anyway, that's what we're gonna be using with the SAO Easy City file the priority form. So you need to read this file and you're going to be reading it into arrays. Now, neither Octave nor uh, C likes arrays that have variables of different types. Okay, they wanted them all, to, all the values should be floats or all the values should be integers or all the values should be strings. But that is not what we have here. Here we have one column is strings, one column is integers, the priorities, and then two of the columns are floats. So let's just go ahead and store these values that come in from SAO Easy City into four separate arrays. An array of strings that is 6,893 elements long, an array of integers that is 6,900 and whatever, 600, whatever the number is, and then two arrays, one of latitudes and one of longitudes. So, um, you know, for example, you might declare one of them to be station ID where it is 6,893 stations long, each of which could be up to 10 characters long. Priority could be a variable stored in an integer array that is 6,893 integers. All right. Then we might have a latitude. I'm calling it here longitude. Um, actually, I believe the next one is latitude, not longitudes, but whatever. Um, you know, again, maybe longitude isn't the best choice. Longitude table, lawn table might be a good answer because it's from your table. I don't know. Same with latitude. I know commonly students use words like lat table for the name of this array. That's good. And it's going to have 6,893 floats in it. Okay, so if I may humbly suggest, um, I like to pound define at the top of my program uh, a, uh, a constant. I'll call it num stations, that is just 6,893. I don't know. I like to do that. But you don't have to. And that way, then I just created my, up at the, you know, after I declare, after I start main, okay, I'm going to declare all these arrays. And then we're going to start working with this file. 
All right, well, we're going to open the file. That, of course, is already something you know how to do. I don't need to tell you that you need a file pointer. You know, maybe we'll call this F table. And you will F open F table, which will actually be your copy of SAO Easy City. Just go ahead and get a copy of SAO.EZ.City from my home directory. That's fine. You know how to do that by now. And if you don't, let me know. All right, then what I want you to do is read it in for I from zero to eyes less than num stations, 6,893. Read in. F-scan in your station ID. F-scan in your priority. F-scan in your latitude. F-scan in your longitude. And then close that loop up with the curly brace. It'll just go round and round and round 6,893 times. I think I see a mistake here again. Again, I've, we've encountered this a handful of times already this semester. I'm pretty sure there doesn't need to be an ampersand or shouldn't be an ampersand in front of station ID here because that is a string and I don't think they use those ampersands but we'll try it both ways and then after you get done reading that from that loop close F table or whatever it is you're calling it so now you have read the SAO Easy City file well you can read it or you have read it you've stored it into arrays I would recommend doing that right at the very top right after main okay you've declared your variables all your variables in arrays should be declared in, at the top of main, but then go ahead before you ask the user anything, before you open the graphics, just go ahead and do this. No problem. Open up, it's only a handful of lines of code. Open up the SEO Easy City file and read it in into these arrays and then close it back up. Okay. I would recommend doing it with a for loop like I demonstrated on that slide before because you know how many lines are in this file, 6,893. You could do this, there would be ways to do it with a while, not FEOF command. Uh, the way you do your map files, but because we know how many rows are in this file, SAO Easy City is a thing. Uh, it's always 6,893 lines long, so it's no problem. Okay, let's look back at our set of instructions here for how we were going to do assignment 12. We, re we originally said, one, open the window, two, draw the map, three, for every observation, plot it. Okay, I would say let's shift that down a little bit. Step one is now read the SAO Easy City file. Okay, so you've got all that information. Now, open the graphics window, then draw the map, then for every station in your current, as you read through current underscore SEO WXP, uh, plot the data. All right. How are we going to do that? How are we going to actually use this data from the SAO Easy City file to complete that tricky step I have circled there? How are we going to plot those requested variables? Um, well, now we have, for every station, we now know it's latitude and longitude. We just got to match them up. Remember matching up was a big challenge in um, ATS-564. Figuring out how do you match up. Okay, I now have the information for Omaha, but where is Omaha in this table? I now have the observation for Chicago. Where is Chicago in this table? That's computationally expensive. It's not that complicated of a loop or whatever, but it's going to take time. Um, you know, your program, though, is a compiled program. It's going to run fairly fast. I mean, I don't know, maybe a second or two to do these calculations. So what you're going to be doing here, I'm just stealing some code here from um, assignment 8, where you were while not end of file fin, where fin was the current underscore SAOWXP file. Remember this from your pro assignment 8? Okay. Well, you had code that read in the observation and then, like, skipped to the end of the line and decoded the observation and so on. And then there's going to have to be this step where we determine what is the latitude and longitude of the station that that report goes to. Okay, now we know we're going to find it in our current underscore SAO, no, in our SAO.EZCity file. Then we'll know the latitude and the longitude. And then we'll transform that latitude and longitude into X and Y. And then we'll plot it using gprintf at X and Y. Okay, this doesn't sound so hideous. All right. That step of determine where it is, though, is a little bit sneaky. Let's think about that for a second here. Let's say you just read in one line from uh, the current underscore SEO WXP file. Um, let's say you just read in a station identifier, and let's call it target ID. So you have a little string called target ID. It's currently equal to KBNA. Okay, that's Nashville. KBNA. All right, now what we need to do is go back to that array of all those 6,893 stations, and we got to figure out which one matches. Which one is the same as what's currently in target ID? So I would say that that part that I just have a little comment there, determine where that station is, I would swap in a simple little loop like this. 
for i equals zero to i equals less than to i is less than num stations, so we're going through all the stations. If not string compare, target ID and station ID i, in other words, the ith row of the station ID array, if they are equal, remember not string uh, that exclamation point string compare is read not string compare, not string compare, and then two names of strings. That's the same thing as like if the string is equal to that one. It's a weird thing, that string compare command. All right, so if they're, they are the same, then what you can do is say, okay, so my my ID or my row or something like that might be better than my ID is equal to I. Whatever, okay, so I'm going to be going through all 6,893 rows of those tables. Are you KBNA? No. Are you KBNA? No. Are you KBNA? All of blah, 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 blah. And so someplace, are you KBNA? Yes. All right, then in this case, I'm saying I'm on row I, and now my ID is equal to I. So now I know, I mean, I'll keep going down. I mean, I'm, we're not being clever here and making us uh, break out of this loop or anything. It will continue to go through all 6,893 rows. But now by the time we get done with this loop, my ID is equal to the row in the SAO Easy City file where our station is located. So then we could use latitude my ID, you know, row my ID in latitude is the latitude of our station. And longitude, square brackets, my ID is the longitude of our station. And we can do things like send that off to transform lat and transform lon, which will gladly convert them uh, to x and y coordinates. And then you can take the x and y coordinate of it and clip it so that um, you know you don't want the, the values to plot if they're outside of your clipping window. And then you could take that x and y coordinate and gprintf it. Oh, gprintf at this x and y, your temperature. Oh, this is pretty slick, cool. So this assignment 12 is basically just a combination of parts of assignment 8 and parts of assignment 11. From assignment 8, you had to read the current SAO WXP file and um, you had some code in there that was about finding stations and so on. Was it a match? The user entered a station and then you were comparing what the user entered to the, to the stations. But, but the same basic idea, like how you use a string compare command, that should all work. And assignment 11, of course, was brilliant. It was that drawing of a map. So let me give you a little hint here as to how to start on this. Go ahead and copy all your A11.C, you know, assignment 11 or whatever, over to your new assignment 12. You don't need to rewrite any of that map stuff. It's working now. I mean, you might want to change the map domain or the colors or the map databases. You know, uh, most of the time students go nuts for assignment 11 and they've got hot pink maps with bright green rivers and whatever. Okay, you probably don't want to go nuts because these maps are going to get pretty ugly with time, uh, you know, with all the data and so on. You want to probably keep the map under control. And then from assignment 8.c, go and get the code that does that business of reading the current WX, current SAO WXP file. I mean, you already have that all that decode stuff working and stuff. Just go get it okay? and add it to the right place in this assignment 12, and you're going to be a big chunk of the way. So you'll be ready to start filling in the gaps with this new stuff about uh, reading in the arrays from SAO Easy City and finding that when you once you have read in a station, finding that station in SAO Easy City's arrays, great. But I really want to emphasize here that you definitely are only going to read SAO Easy City once. Read it once at the top of your program. Well, yeah, right after Maine and all its declarations and all that kind of stuff. But d don't have that in some kind of big loop or whatever. I mean, yes, it, okay, you open the file and you read 6,893 times to get that one line, you know, one line at a time. But then close it up and don't do it again. It's a very common mistake for students to think they got to read that file every time that they're inside of the loop reading in stations from current underscore SEO WXP. And that's not the right strategy. All right. You have the tools between this and the reading in the textbook and so on. You've got the t tools to, to uh, produce this map. Isn't this amazing that you were, you know, in August you were learning about VI. Now look at what you're doing. This is great. All right. Please let me know if you have any questions.